well, boys. Looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? Two movies on the show that we will spoil today, mm-hmm. and you can use the chapters to skip the spoilers. Okay, so uh, do we just roll into them then? Well, my name is Eric. Oh, right. And then Hi, Eric. You have a name as well. Yeah, my name is Michael. Wow, really mixing it up today. Man. There's films as well that are mm-hmm. also on the show. Yeah, we're going to cover and spoil and give you the opportunity to skip right over the Big Lebowski and Sideways. Excellent. So it's been kind of a while since we uh, we drug out the old wooden Trojan horse, right? Uh-huh. Um, I feel like that's become such an obvious thing that we're doing that we don't really <laughs> we don't really talk about it. However, if there was ever a day to point out the obvious, it would probably be <laughs> the day that we're doing. Well, at the very least, Sideways. Yeah. I don't know what the fuck the Big Lebowski. We'll we'll deal with that separately. Um, but. It, this is kind of our, uh, I guess, a way to bring men up a couple... Men in robes and boxers double feature. Maybe it's our men in robes and boxers who secretly teach you, maybe optionally teach you philosophy. Mm-hmm. Is that... Sure. Although I think the philosophy is going to be heavier on the Big Lebowski. And the, uh, I don't know, let's say let's say the Big Lebowski will be our philosophy class and sideways will be our English class. Perfect. Definitely not our wine tasting class, though. If mm-hmm. you want that shit, you should read all of the reviews that came out when Sideways <laughs> debuted. Thank fuck before the internet was large enough that people could create shows about critical reviews of Sideways. Now, we're going to kind of switch around the order here. Um, I thought that it would be a great idea to do Sideways first. Yeah. Sideways being the brooding drama in this uh-huh. pair up. And The Big Lebowski, second. The Big Lebowski being the hilarious cult hit, The Big Lebowski. Uh, But that's not actually what these movies are. No. Uh, You're insistent we do them the other way around, and I'm inclined to agree with you. Yeah, well, Big Lebowski is really funny. Really had a good time watching Big Lebowski. And if you watch Sideways second, uh, I feel I'm going to go out on a limb and use the phrase, I feel like you get it more. Okay. Um, <laughs> we'll see whether or not means. it's meant to be gotten is yet to be decided. It's certainly more accessible if it's second. So we're going to do that. I have, um, <laughs> I have a raspberry tea was my point. So we can actually begin speaking uh, about the Big Lebowski. Raspberry tea, very important for this. The film actually opens, as uh, all great epic masterpieces do, with the talking tumbleweed. Right. Which is, I mean, uh, it's setting your Coen Brothers backdrop, right? Yeah. Well, it, it's weird because I, I've always been really standoffish when it comes to The Big Lebowski. Mm-hmm. But I've seen just about every other Coen Brothers movie. Right. And so for- this, is, this is one where I'm extremely excited because I know that you have not seen The Big Lebowski yeah, before today. I hadn't seen it. Uh, So I've been a little frightened and eh, whatever, just put it with sideways. We'll figure it out on the show. But it is, it's, it's, yeah. I mean, it opens with your, your Coen brothers voiceover, your Coen brothers talking tumbleweed. Which we find out later is actually a cowboy. I don't know if that's any, is it more or less ridiculous than a tumbleweed? I think it's a transmorpher to be honest. Wow. Um, You know, the thing that I actually enjoy about the voiceover in the beginning is this realization that uh, the film has. Um, the film knows that it's set in an era, what will later become an era. And, you know, you'll probably notice this more than anybody else seeing it for the first time now, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, plus 10 years after it's come out, this film comes out in 1998 and it talks about the era of the Bush administration and of, um, I mean, of the early nineties. Right. So admittedly it's, it, you know, it's talking about a time that's probably passed by, I don't know what, four to six years Yeah. by the time the movie was sure. created. And so if you saw the movie when it came out, you've continued seeing it over time. You probably, this may have been lost on you, but if you're seeing it fresh now for the first time, I would imagine the fact that the movie is talking about this era, it really does seem like an era now. Yeah, no, it definitely does. I mean, there was a point where you had to... I got jarred and you had to bring me back in because they were talking about recording the score right before he brandishes his cold piece in the bowling alley. Yes. I was 
all taken aback because I was upset that the bowling alley didn't have monitors that sure. automatically kept a score. Sure. And you had to remind me that the film didn't, in fact, take place in the year that it came out. When right. I knew for a fact there were <laughs> monitors in every bowling alley in the United States. Yeah, so it's one thing for the film to take a bit of a stab and say, all right, we're going to set this in an era, in a time uh, and then to actually for that to hold up years right. and years later, for us to really look back and go, wow, that that fucking was kind of an era, <laughs> wasn't it? I guess what that really says is that all periods of time will be eras <laughs> given enough yeah. time. But to try and represent what that era would truly be about, that's probably where a lot of the cult appeal comes from. Thinking back to, you know, when I think about a, a lot of the people who consider this a cult film in that age bracket thinking back to what they were probably doing around yeah. the era that the big Lebowski right. came out. I was, uh, I was, um, in kindergarten. Okay. So maybe not you in particular, <laughs> you were not when it came out. Oh, during the sure. Okay. Well, so that's another great thing is then talking about the early nineties coming out in the late nineties and watching the film. Now, I'm sure that everybody can pretty much there's, relate to a piece in their yeah, life. Yeah, well, there's when three they were degrees about. of separation that sure. you're allowed to, you can relate it to your life now. You can be nostalgic and remember, oh, I remember when I saw this in the theater, or you can remember that you were in kindergarten in 1993 <laughs> sure. and that you were probably napping. Not a lot of white Russians for you in 1993? Um, yeah, actually, it's surprising. I've actually, uh, this year, the uh, I've had a 0% increase in white Russians from kindergarten to now in my life. I'm impressed. But I will say that they look delicious, but that's just because I'm a I'm a... I'm a coffee guy and things that look more opaque and less like, I don't know, dirty gasoline sure, sure. Um, seem more appealing to me. If there's anything that could ever get me back into drinking, it's the every time I see the Big Lebowski, I think the, the white Russian, that looks really tasty. I wonder what that tastes like. It's, uh, it's two parts coffee liqueur, it's five parts vodka, and it's three parts cream, essentially making it a latte with alcohol in it. Yeah. Right? So, I mean... It looks kind of fucking delicious. When um, the theater I mention all the time, Showplace Icon, right? When that opened downtown, it's kind of this, uh, it's, uh, you know, what they call a VIP experience in a theater. It's a nicer theater. It has a, a little bit of a lounge in it. You pay for like a, a luxury theater. You pay so there aren't screaming infants and sticky floors. Right. And so at the bar there, all of their drinks are movie themed. And one of the drinks is, uh, I believe it's actually called The Dude. And it Dude. is, of course, the White Russian from The Big Lebowski with the cream that kind of floats down from the top. I j it, it looks fucking delicious. I feel like maybe this is just for me, but uh, the fucking White Russian is as much a character as any of the actual people yeah. in the movie. You see this thing. I mean, it has more scenes than Steve Buscemi's character does. Right. That's true. White Russian probably in <laughs> almost twice as many scenes as, yeah. uh, as Steve Buscemi's character. But that's because it's glued to the hand of Jeff Bridges, of, of the, dude, the dude. Who, I mean, I always think of this movie as starring John Goodman, but that's not the case. No. See, and that's another thing going back to having, having never seen this film before. I didn't know who this film followed I had heard from somebody that the film actually never left the bowling alley. Oh, not um, true. But yeah, I had no idea, you know, who the film followed. I knew that Jeff Bridges was in it, but the lore that surrounded the dude right. outside of sure. the film sure. made it seem like to go back to earlier this year, the same fucking bullshit that happens with Glengarry Glenn Ross. Oh yeah. Yeah. Where People are like, oh, yeah, Jeff Bridges is the dude. And in my head, I'm thinking he's in one scene. Yeah, He right, walks right. in, says some really cool, far out, trippy shit, man, then flies underneath some uh, vaginas. And then that's his only scene in the film. You're thinking he's the uh, he's Jesus, the bowler. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that that's the character he's actually going right. To be. He's some cameo that happens to be like. He's the guy that the main characters wish they could be. Or maybe that the other characters need to take a hint from. Yeah. I mean, especially when you look at Walter, who is fucking <laughs> high strung, like you would not believe. I mean, pairing these characters up. Sure. It's uh, that's that's the movie right yeah. there. The fact that you have these two guys uh, hanging out and bowling. Right. And playing these situations off each other. All you need from there is a, a downright bizarre supporting cast for them to kind of. I, yeah. I think about this movie like pinball. I already right? know exactly. I think isn't there a Big Lebowski pinball game? I there's probably. I'm a pinball pretty sure machine. there is. Yeah, I would imagine so. But you're just bouncing off of these other characters, 
uh, some kind of insane situation that they're in. I mean, you have, you know, Julianne Moore's character, um, Maud, who is this naked painting yeah. feminist. One of the best parts of the film. Not my favorite character in the film, sure, certainly. but definitely in my top three. Well, also, fil- this is the first time I've thought that Julianne Moore was actually hot in anything. Yeah, interesting how that happens. You get her naked and painting and talking about, you know, women's rights and all of a sudden. Um, not so much women's rights as a kind of caricature of feminism. Yeah. I mean, she's she's in the movie as a feminist uh, in kind of a, a dual purpose, which is interesting. She's talking about a lot of the, the great ideas of feminism and, you know, busting myths about nymphomaniacs and how women like to have sex too and right. it's not just a man's game. But at the same time, she's kind of a joke. She's uh-huh. also there as a punchline. Right. Uh, so there's her, there's uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Oh, he, that's my number one. Who is, oh uh, my God. Seeing him play off of, I think his name is David Huddleston, the guy who plays the yeah. big Lebowski, right? Not the tiny Lebowski. Right. Not the bum Lebowski. Yeah. You know, when he starts yelling and Philip Seymour <laughs> Hoffman's character just looks really uncomfortable. Oh my and, God. Uh, the other thing is when he starts introducing, you know, when the dude first comes over and, um, and they're looking through all the pictures and stuff. Watching Philip Seymour Hoffman give that tour is so believable. Yeah. I mean, I really believe that he could give that tour if mm-hmm. he'd stopped acting. Right. If that was a thing that it just seems like... It's his backup plan. Yeah, right. It's such a small role to say something insulting like he was born to play it or whatever. But right. I'm I'm amazed with how he can take such a trivial, meaningless, sure. throwaway thing... And make it so memorable, appear to be having so much fucking fun with it. Well, yeah, I mean, that role is not the role that, on paper, you would think is a standout position in the film. But the way Philip Seymour Hoffman plays that role and his dedication to being that character. It's the dedication. Oh, my God. It it brings him alive in any scene he's... I really... I could watch just his scenes, close-ups of reactions. Well, that's the best part is he's not even the focus of right. a lot of these scenes. Uh, the one I know you really like where he's in the car. Yeah. Where it's uh, the dude is kind of you know forced into the car to have one of those gets, awkward uh, death to smoochie kind of conversations. Yeah, exactly. Death to smoochie. Right. Perfect. Yeah, so he's being scolded. And I mean, there's really only two spots you put the camera inside right. that car. So it's looking to one side or looking to the other. So it almost seems an accident that he is in the frame right. when uh, the dude's being yelled at. Mm-hmm. But his reactions are amazing. So perfect. You know, you may not have ever even noticed them before because the scene's so intense and you're looking yeah. at the man yelling. But if you just uh, glance off to the yep. left, there's a whole other film just <laughs> happening on that man's face right there. Yep. And Peter Stormare, too. Um, right. Constantine, right, was From, the, the yeah. big uh, Cons- also, who is Peter Stormare. Uh, Million Dollar Hotel. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, after figuring out, you know, who he was. Right. Um, his role in this is a nihilist. Lead singer of Autobahn. Yeah, the collection of those characters. I mean, especially having that showdown at the end. Yeah, all three uh, of those amazing. guys. Oh, my God. So before we get too much further, I have a very selfish thing that I just want to talk to you about. Okay. Our show be damned. Uh, you're seeing The Big Lebowski for the first time. This is not the reaction I expected from you. No, I, I, this is not the reaction I expected from me. I'll be completely honest. So we come on here, we do the show. We stopped caring about three years ago if we enjoy each other's films. Yep. Rarely do. I mean, I can almost distinctly remember the specific movies where you kind of said, yeah, so before we start, hey, this movie, what'd you think of that? Yeah. Pretty cool, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you're actually showing me a film. The rest of the time, it's just, what is this film? What's going into it? Sure. We're thinking about it. Right. It's, uh, we're not it's even really. It's almost a technical perspective, but we keep the positive spin whether or not we like the movie so you know this doesn't come up a whole lot right and your reaction to films i mean a lot of times you will uh you'll kind of sit on something for a while yeah. you'll let it kind of go trigger over in treat. your mind trigger treat last year was a perfect example right even when we did it on the show i had uh-huh. a pretty good idea that you liked it a lot more but yeah, it wasn't sure. until that year end going oh yeah you were in love with this uh-huh. movie so uh i get very measured reactions from you even when you enjoy something it's rare that I've seen basically anything impress you, um, <laughs> films or otherwise. Yeah, It's very, very... I, on the other hand, I, you show me something and I think everything is the new greatest thing yeah, in the world. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Which makes everything about as good as, you know, anything else. Yeah. It, it well, says something but about at the a, same time, I just... 
in five years' time, <laughs> both of us have the same reaction to a film that we both like. Yeah, you know sure, what I mean? Sure, that's And it's right. usually, it's almost, it's almost kind of a inverse effect where you'll watch a movie, love it, and then not watch it for two years. Right, yes. I will watch a movie and think it might have something to it and watch it six times sure. over the next two sure, years absolutely. and by the end of that two years i know it by heart and you go is that still good so all of this is important now because you are our uh, test subject here right you're a case study you are the single individual who has not seen i'm the uh, only person left on earth that had not seen the big it's kind of like when we did troll 2 right and we and were the we only were two the, people we were right the, yeah. yeah so i want to i want to revisit that idea for a second uh-huh uh, you appear to be kind of floored by The Big Lebowski. Okay, so it was obvious, and I want to point that out while uh, we were watching the film, that I was cracking up the whole time. Yeah, right. You're having I a just, great time with this I thing. was laughing. Well, so the other thing, and, and I have to point this out, um, you once described yourself on the show a long time ago, kind of tongue-in-cheek as a contrarian. Yeah, right? for sure. Absolutely. So both of us see things that are sort of status quo uh-huh. or sort of a uh, lowest common denominator, right? right? Everybody loves these things, and so we naturally have a feeling like we should just kind of hate them. Right. Something that everybody loves really needs to prove itself to me. Sure. It's it's not that I'm going to go into it disliking it, but it can't just be kind of okay. I, not to say that oh, something's, you know, well-loved, Sure. so we'll hate it. Right. Because no, clearly our show is not, not <laughs> is an indication of, of uh, the contrary. Mm-hmm. But the Big Lebowski, everybody starts saying, hey, Big Lebowski, this is such a great epic right. cult thing. Best movie ever made. Right. And so then you see it, and you said something interesting to me. You said uh, kind of lived up to the hype. Yeah. I'm sitting here thinking the Big Lebowski is going to be the same as every other Coen Brothers movie for me, where I get it, I enjoy it. You don't see greatest film ever, right. which is what they're exactly. usually billed as. And so I'm watching the Big Lebowski... And I start realizing that all these Coen Brothers techniques, when used perfectly, in perfect right. execution and synchronicity with each other, compose one of the best films ever made. Yeah. All the weird characters that the Coen Brothers don't use fluidly anymore, where they bring in two or three weird characters and a bunch of normal characters. Right. That really played into it, and it was funny. As mm-hmm. fuck. Yeah, which it I really is. Did not expect at all. I expected, honestly, I expected a lot of, I'm a bum. It's the 90s. Sure. We're all kind of bored and doing drugs jokes. <laughs> right, right. But, I mean, right around the time, uh, right around the time the dude is in the bathtub. Sure. And Autobahn <laughs> brings in right. the marmot. And he I like goes, how you just refer to them as Autobahn. That's good. And, and he, he says, nice marmot. And then they throw it in the bathtub right, with him. Right. <laughs> that was the point where I realized that it's not a Coen Brothers sophisticrat right. kind of... The newer Coen Brothers, really, they've been going for kind of the, uh, I, I guess, a higher brow of comedy. Sure. And I mean that in the nicest way. Absolutely. But Well, you think about stuff like No Country for Old Men, yeah. Serious Man. True Grit. I mean, True Grit's another good example. They did have Burn After Reading, which was yeah. a lot, you know, it was more sure. on the funny side of things. It was a comedy. Right. But they, uh, they're they effective at doing these, I don't want to call them brooding dramas, but that's really almost sure. by comparison to something right. like The Big Lebowski, Well, there's right? not enough marmots in the bathtub, I think, <laughs> right. uh, sure. in their newer stuff. Yeah. And it's just, the bowling made a whole lot of sense. Yeah. It wasn't the center of the film. It was sure. kind of, it was the uh, Winchester yeah, right. back when we did Shaun of the Dead. Yeah. Everything, it just, I totally get it. I got all the lines. They totally worked. Right. All the lines that I had heard... People quoting the nom suddenly yeah, makes sense. Everything. You know what I love with Walter and his Vietnam uh, fixation is that you know in any other movie this would be that kind of eye rolling shtick that a character has. Oh, that's his thing. He was a nom, mm-hmm. and that's just kind of what we're playing up. It's a fucking cartoon, right? Yeah. Except in this movie, we get through basically one nom reference before people then give him shit every time he says right. something. You know, in any other film. Uh, once again, that builds up over time. We become aggravated. We get it. You have a nom thing. And maybe at the end, they call him out about it. Right. Oh, hey, you've been mentioning Vietnam for two hours. Except these characters all really live with this guy. Yeah. They're tired of this shit. Right. They had that experience. Right. Six films ago. You know, they already know about that. So when we walk into their world, they're already giving him crap in different ways. Every mm-hmm. single time he makes some offhanded right. nom reference, which is what makes them even funnier. 
Because instead of just being, oh, I know this scene's going to come up where this character, they slip on a banana peel every time they walk by and that's just their thing. When I hear a Nam reference before my eyes roll back into my head, I know that somebody else is going to make fun of him. That then becomes the shtick, Mm -hmm. is that he makes this reference and someone else gives him shit. Yep. So you mentioned all these characters, and uh, I think part of the chemistry here is we are combining all of these characters in a situation where they're they're sort of in an over their you know head kind of uh, they get mixed up in what's almost a conspiracy. Yeah, it's really in line with a lot of the Coen Brothers comedy signature mm-hmm. that works really well. You know, I just mentioned Burn After Reading. It's the same kind of thing there. You know, finding this. Uh, I won't even really say anything about that. Finding an object or whatever, and then getting in over their heads or the lady killers right. same sort of thing you have this collection of people they they set out to do something turns out that job might have been a little too big for them <laughs> but here that takes them on this sort of alice in wonderland adventure which was originally our idea for pairing these two up is kind of going on that adventure and the adventure um took us in such different places that i guess we didn't even really think about that you know setting up the show but you're all over the place and i think that's part of what's funny about it is seeing how insane this could really get. Sure. Kind of reminds me of Kiss Kiss Bang Bang a little bit. Oh yeah, bit. there's a lot of that in there for sure. Although those characters seem to be on to what's going on a little bit more yeah, than Yeah, well, this. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is a lot more about being hip. Yeah. Whereas the Big Lebowski, there's still a weird square. They they use the word square sure. as yeah. if it's still 1960. So actually, if I can, I've just brought up the 60s and opened my own door into a conversation Here it that is. I've been meaning to bring up. Join me on this brief thought experiment. Absolutely. Imagine our two characters from Easy Rider, mm-hmm. Billy and Captain America. Sure. Now imagine it's 1993 and both of these characters have grown up. Sure. Okay? So the dude is obviously just Dennis Hopper. That's <laughs> sure. No, there is no stretch of the imagination that the sure, dude is sure. what Dennis Hopper's, especially Billy, but Dennis Hopper. I like to think it's the guy from Tron all grown sure. up, but that's fine too. But think about if... Wyatt, Captain America from Mm -hmm. Easy Rider, his ideologies of freedom, he ends up getting drafted in Vietnam and then his ideologies shift to how bad Vietnam was and he becomes preachy about the wrong kind of ideologies and then he gets jaded and goes a little nuts but still wears the same sunglasses. (laughs) Right, right. The Big Lebowski is just Easy Rider too. You know, it's my inability to have seen that coming that really explains your love of this movie (laughs) that I should have anticipated. Yeah, that gets into some of the philosophy stuff. Yeah. And what I enjoy about both of the films we're doing today, and really the core of the pair, is that you are presented an outlet for this philosophy that's really completely optional. You can watch The Big Lebowski and not pay any attention to any sort of philosophy going on here, or you could watch it and you could absolutely eat that up. Sure. And you don't have to be one of two people. You could be the same individual who one day wants to come home and kick back and watch The Big Lebowski, you know, do a midnight movie thing. And the other day, you could feel intellectually lazy and that you need to do some character study and you could sit down and fucking watch The Big Lebowski. And it serves both of those purposes. And you can turn them on and off easily. The Mm -hmm. film allows you to do that easily. So, I mean, if there's really any double purpose that's going on here, that is uh, far and away the best one. Second being sneaking in some Coen Brothers flight scenes. Yeah, and the, the dream sequences, these vision sequences, right? The um, the acid flashbacks, right. talking about that 60s character. You know, these things are great, too, just from a cinema perspective. I mean, they are like elaborate stage shows. They're this digestible kind of symbolism that's very clever. It's more about mood than interpretation. I think anybody can watch one of these and say, well, especially that last one, right? He's obviously the, you know, it's a reference back to the porno movie Mm -hmm. with the titles in there. And, you know, then the flight starts happening. Um, There's all the bowling pins. So it's not a lot of heavy, guess what we're trying to say here, metaphor. Mm -hmm. It's more just, it's it's being very genuine. It's an acid flashback. Right. That's really what it is. Saddam Hussein gives you your bowling shoes. Exactly. Saying more about the era, stuff we already knew, what was going on there. It's not a deep, you know, Vietnam sure. diatribe. Right. It's just an acid flashback yeah, and think, a great one. I think as psychological as this film gets is having a character named Carl Hungus. I mean, it's once you start getting into the hippie stuff. It's once you start thinking back to Dennis Hopper. We have an examination of post-hippie, right? Sure. 
the hippie era is long and gone. Here we have a character, the dude, who uh, his fucking name is the dude. Right. He's stuck back 30 years ago. Uh And we're watching him uh, go through a modern, you know, Pulp Fiction crime thing. Right. You mentioned Pulp Fiction as we were watching yeah, the movie. For sure. A lot of it has to be Maude's haircut uh, as well. Yeah, that definitely, that was a trigger. But rather than having all these characters seriously invested modern day, we take a character from 30 years ago who is laid back and he's cool and he's just fine with everything. And we we make people fuck up his shit. That's yeah. essentially what's going we on. We piss on his carpet. We <laughs> literally have a man pissing on his carpet and uh i mean how brilliant is that writing that that's really yeah. a man comes in and i was gonna say rains on his parade but you just i mean you you can't get any more direct than peeing on his there rug. is no metaphor here. that's yeah that's it the metaphor is right in front of you urinating on your carpet and i love that you know this hippie is a deadbeat in a beach community right in a fucking beach community if there's anywhere that deadbeat means just a little bit more. You take people from a beach community, you put them on the streets of Chicago. We have those people. They're called homeless people. Right. It, I mean, it's really, it's the bottom of what you could possibly <laughs> set out to accomplish. If you have no job and you're in a beach community and you're still looked at by the town sheriff as the ruffian, the guy yeah. who's not contributing anything. Right. I mean, you have to set your aspirations pretty fucking low. As the the voiceover in the beginning tells us, this is mm-hmm. the world's laziest man. Right. He's but he going is the to man. The world's laziest man, but the man. And so you pair him up with a feminist and you talk about those things. You pair him and Walter, especially. Yeah. You pair him and Walter together and you pair those two up against Nihilus. How does Walter, a Vietnam vet <laughs> who really has a chip on his shoulder, react to Nihilus? And, I mean, there's nothing we could possibly say that's more informative than seeing their reactions to yeah. that. So that's under the surface. And if you want to grab that, you can. And you, it's, it's absolutely non-essential. But the end voiceover gives another example of, uh, just in dialogue, a lot of what they do with the philosophy throughout the film. I don't know if it's voiceover if you're, uh, if you're literally in the, staring at the screen. I suppose it's, once again, your favorite uh, mechanism, breaking the fourth wall. I think I get the uh i get the reference and i understand the cliche and i couldn't have picked a better guy to play the cowboy because sure. i think that sam elliott is the best cowboy in cinema since the spaghetti days i think you're married to his mustache That's i am my hypothesis i'm actually there. i'm i am literally attached to his mustache he starts going on and on on yep. a philosophical diatribe yep. and he literally cuts himself off and uh you know it's gotten too heavy i'm boring you here we should probably just go ahead and end the movie. There's nothing else. It's not as if there's a pressing situation right. where he's going, wow, what am I talking about? We should really move on. He's literally just going, you know what? That's probably too much philosophy. I'm going to just shut up right here and let's go ahead and roll those credits. Yeah. Guy bowls a strike and credits roll. There's also, and this is very important, and I really only have a moment to explain this to you. So okay. you're going to have to listen very, very carefully. Okay. There's something called Lebowski Fest. I'm listening. We can't talk about it on the show. There's no way I could do it justice. Okay. Use your Google, Lebowski Fest. Let's talk about Seto Wazoo. Okay. Is, from what I understand, Seto Wazoo is uh, the director of The Room. No, no, that's Tommy Wazoo. Oh, sorry. Or Tommy Wazoo, I guess. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it really matters how you pronounce that guy's name. Uh-huh. Um, we're going to talk about Sideways, which is not Seto Wazoo. I'm going to assume that's how you pronounce it uh-huh. because that, my Japanese, come on. Yeah. We just, uh, we just talked about this with Ichi. We don't need to go back right. over this. Oh, um, so Seto Wazoo is the Japanese remake. It is the I Japanese. I don't know why I didn't put that together. It is the Japanese remake of Sideways. Wow. There's a Japanese remake of Sideways. One question that may spring to mind is why aren't we watching that? Yeah. That certainly says something about a movie's popularity when it yeah. has or when it, it has a Japanese remake rather than the other way around. I definitely feel like Sideways came out in this zeitgeist where it needed to exist. We touched on it when we did Closer, mm-hmm. but I feel like Sideways yeah. could not have come out yeah. at any other time than when it did. And it wouldn't have been successful. It certainly wouldn't have been nominated for any of the awards that things pe- oh absolutely and the focus wouldn't have been nearly as soft well no i was thinking about that the whole time we were watching it yeah i was thinking closer this is like that one weird year i talked about and yeah. closer you want to talk about a very particular era this movie doesn't even know it's part of that era right but you're right it's the zeitgeist it's that thing of the time that everyone was involved in and that fucking thing was sideways 
It was that year. It yeah. was, I think it was just 2004. It might have been the next following summer or whatever. But sure. uh, man, there were so many independent movies coming out. And this was the one really getting, I think this was probably the most popular of, yeah. you know, of all of them. Well, I think it was the first underdog Academy film that really stuck. And also this was when Paul Giamatti didn't really exist. Yeah, well, he'd done American Splendor. Right. Um, but beyond that, I don't think, I mean, Paul Giamatti has been on our show a hundred thousand times. A hundred thousand times. Uh, we were trying to figure out who He's rivals. He's sung on our show. He's had his chickpea removed. Oh, God. Who uh, who rivals Paul Giamatti in number of occurrences on our show? Uh, if I had to guess off the top of my head, um, I would say probably Bruce Willis. I know you've got you've got a vote in for Kurt Russell. Kurt Russell's getting there. Maybe Adrian Barbeau. Uh, I don't know about that. Robert England. Robert England wins hands down. Kane Hodder as well. That's true. Um, other people should be doing this work for us though. Uh, we should get a, like a running list of actors because we don't care about actors right. for as much as we're talking about actors today. We should get a running list of them who uh who've appeared on our show a billion times right and the winning actor gets to come on and do an interview no no interviews with actors double feature show at gmail.com send us who you think has appeared in the most movies and if you guess right we'll put your answer on the show as the truth so man i do not know where to start with this i guess we start with wine tasting yeah right with something needs to be said about this sure and i think all that needs to be said is in that first wine tasting scene right um it, it's kind of a perfect scene for uh, as memorable and odd as it is. Um, I guess when you talk about whether or not it's perfect, you get into the movie's intentions, uh-huh. right? You know, watching this after The Big Lebowski, and the reason we wanted to make other people do that, is this movie becomes the funniest fucking thing right. you've ever seen in your entire <laughs> existence. I had a giggle fit through the first yep. hour of this film. It's it's equal parts you're laughing, you're loving the film, you're getting the jokes, and then the other half of the time, you're shouting <laughs> right. at Miles, right. calling him a fucker and a douchebag for being the kind of person that he is. Absolutely, but yeah. But totally in a way that you want to laugh, you just would rather yell at him. Right. Well, it almost reminds me of Philip Seymour Hoffman from the last movie. Yeah. But when they're first doing the wine tasting, Jack's reaction to Miles, that's really why I think this is a perfect scene. You have... Jack uh, giving this, first of all, the movie is, if it's Trojan horsing anything, it's Trojan horsing wine knowledge. Uh-huh. Well, Everybody that, came away from this movie knowing way more about wine than they or, ever thought they would. Or so so they thought. In reality, it just affected the wine economy and right. the tourism economy. Merlot down, Pinot up. I know nothing about wine outside of Sideways. Well, that's my point, right? Yeah. If you ask most people who uh, who watch a good handful of films what they know about wine, you will find one that uh, art snobs in relation to film are not the same as art snobs in relation to wine. You might think there's a, a big crossover there, mm-hmm. and there isn't. You'll also find that anybody who's seen Sideways usually cites it as that's why they know everything they know about wine, and they know nothing else. But from that scene, you get the exact process. You take uh, the, the really painstaking detail at studying a glass and the movie walks you through those steps in such a way you could probably do it yourself. Meanwhile, Jack's reactions are at first casual and toward the end, I don't give a shit becomes his reaction. I think you're fucking ridiculous becomes his reaction. But even when his reaction is, oh, cool. Yeah, I dig it. Yep. Mm, Good wine. I think it's awesome. I think this wine's awesome. I think, yeah, I think that it becomes... I think this wine is awesome is really all you need to... It it becomes one of the funniest jokes in the film when Miles is tasting wines and very definitively describing why that wine sucks. And then Jack just goes, oh, I like it. It kind of reminds me of when people talk about teaching both sides of a controversy, Mm -hmm. you know, like we talked about in the, in the days of the evolution documentaries, you know, doing, um, what's, what was the intelligent design one with that terrible actor, Ben Stein? Oh, Expelled. Expelled was the name of that fucking awful (laughs) offensive Holocaust piece. I mean that in both the film insulted victims of the Holocaust and was itself a Holocaust. But we did, uh, you know, we talked about it with the Bill Maher one as well with Religious, and we've talked about it with the Richard Dawkins stuff. Two people come forward, and they have both completely valid views. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion. Sure. One opinion is, 
I detect a, a, a strong strawberry and a, maybe a hint of almond. And is that a, a tiny bit of cheese just in the aftertaste? And the other is, uh, I don't know, pretty good. And they're totally both right. equal. I mean, in the conversation, I actually feel like sometimes Jack strikes up more of a conversation sure. in talking about wine when he says, I don't know, I think it's pretty killer, killer yeah, wine. Definitely. Yeah, for sure. There's also, there's another, there's another kind of dichotomy like that going on in this film. And it's mm-hmm. uh, whether Virginia Madsen is more interesting than Sandra O. Oh. Now, I don't, I mean, I didn't mean to put you on the spot, but you did, you did reveal your hand while we were watching it that you didn't know anything about Sandra O, oh, but that she was intriguing to you. And I will now put my cards on the table and right. say what I know of Virginia Madsen is sideways Candyman, and she had a brief stint in this tv show that shouldn't have gotten canceled called the event ah right but honestly i don't know anything about what i assume is the bulk of her career which is probably movies that i don't see yeah i know sandra O oh was in something else we saw in double feature you remember that one <sighs> no hard candy remember she oh, had about yeah. five seconds in that yeah yeah which was which was an interesting part um a great little brief appearance Another movie that had very few actors in it, right? right? That relied on uh, a lot of character stuff. She was in Arliss as well, way back, an old HBO show. Super points if anyone even knows what the fuck that is. Mm -hmm. But uh, somebody who I see and I think, oh, very enigmatic. I know nothing about their career. I'm interested. This seems like two very distinct paths you and I both have Uh that uh, perhaps run parallel that we could see. You know, a lot of these movies that uh, both of these actors appear in. Right. And they have great parts in here. Yeah. Great parts. Yeah. I feel like Virginia Madsen's character is just this very intense. uh, She seems so dark. Right. And knowledgeable and aware, almost to the point of being evil and malicious. (laughs) Okay. But she has no malintent. The one that I, I distinctly remember being in the moment of is the scene where Maya is talking to Miles about her interest in the evolution of, you know, of these different wines. Mm -hmm. And he's asking her kind of what she wants to do with her future. And she starts, I mean, she leans forward into the frame and the soft piano that's all throughout the movie. When it's not swanky lounge. Yeah, I was just going to say, it's almost got a kind of a sense of mystery to it sometimes. Solving a caper music. And then he finds the wallet, caper solved. But it's soft piano and it's soap opera. And I'm kind of laughing to myself because it's corny. It's funny, sort of out of context. But her passion seems so genuine. Sure. And it's, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, she's talking uh, really, really deeply about how she loves thinking about these uh, these wines because this was what was happening that year. She's explaining her passion for something that everybody else is laughing off as goofy. Mm-hmm. It's something like, you know, the two of us are looking at this and saying, ha-ha, pretentious wine stuff. Right. But at the same time, I get why they're interested in wine now. Sure. I understand that. Sure. I think there's something very cool about going back and saying, oh, this is a 62, what was happening. And we do mm-hmm. the same goddamn thing with films all yeah, the time. Yeah, we definitely do. This is a 62 is. film. What was happening in 62 that Who caused died this that film made to be? This film. And, and, you know, so I don't think anybody dying caused the wine to taste the way it does. Right. But it does remind you of what might have been happening that year. Sure. It does give you a, a sense of a timeline to other events that may be important. And talking about that passion, I think, is, is strangely sincere. Uh, maybe it's almost surreal how sincere it is. Right. For how laughable it is at the same time. I feel like she's stringing Miles along. For what eventually is bound to happen. She knows going in, this is going to end with the two of them together. And now I'm getting a little bit into, I don't want to step on sideways toes, but she has to let him discover himself right. before she'll take him in. Wow. It's as if the metaphor was placed right in front of you on a plate for you to eat upon. Yeah. I mean, the way you describe her is perfect for Miles. However, Miles is kind of a shitty person. Right. Miles steals money from an old lady. Right. Miles is, <laughs> he's kind of a bad guy. And the fact that he's depressed, sometimes you see a movie and the protagonist or one of the protagonists is depressed and you feel for them. And that is the point of the movie. You get that they're down and the movie tries to put you right down there with them. And that's a, I mean, that's a cliche about artists. Depressed sure. artists make incredible art, right? Mm-hmm. But this is a really fantastic look at 
you know, here's this depressed guy. Hate him. Hate him yeah. for ruining everybody's He's time. He's ruining the movie. Way to be mopey, asshole. Way to go around and spoil everything for everybody. You have no one to blame but yourself. This takes a really fucking tough love yeah. approach. But And the flip side of the coin is you get this happy party animal trying to love life and enjoy everything. And he's a dick, too. Turns out, yeah, total fuck. fuck. that guy, <laughs> right? Well, okay, so, you know, I want to say Jack is better for a second. Mm-hmm. I don't. Let me, let me just go ahead and spoil that. I don't say Jack is better. <laughs> but I want to purely because it could almost be misconstrued that the film is saying, well, this guy's a jerk because he's depressed and he's dragging everybody down with him and it's his own fucking fault and he should just love life. But Jack's a bad guy because he has a lot of sex. Right. And so my gut reaction, kind of like we were talking about earlier, sure. you hear a film is the greatest thing ever and you just want to be like, fuck that film, that film's yeah. not that great. I see, oh, that guy over there, we're supposed to hate him because he has a lot of sex. Fuck that. That guy's the man. I love that guy. Right. What a great outlook. Sure. Have sex with people, casual thing, no hangups, totally fine. He's got it. But there are some, some serious problems yeah. with the sex he's having. Well, I think the first most serious problem is the fact that he, the premise of the film is that it's a getaway before he's getting married. Sure. And furthermore, that he's a liar. Right. And... Thirdly, that he totally takes advantage of Miles being a sure. good friend. Yeah, he is a terrible friend. Yeah. Uh, Jack is. I mean, you could say that about Miles, too. But Miles, in but this Miles is there. Miles mm-hmm. actually goes into the guy's house to get the sure. wallet. He does. When he shouldn't have to. Yeah, that uh, that shot of MC Ganey running naked out of the... Uh, that's the guy from Lost, people. Yep. That is Tom. That is Beardy from Lost. Uh, and he is very naked. That's kind of a, a terrifying scene. It is. Especially he's, he's just gigantic. running towards the car and he keeps he's, getting bigger. Yeah, you know, and that's the thing. I feel I feel like I need to be running away. Sure. I feel frightened by this. Right. There's something terrifying. This naked man is lumbering towards you very quickly. You just ran out of his house. Shut the car door. It's yeah. it's the moment where the slasher's chasing sure. you. And arguably it's probably the second most famous cock on our show. The second most famous? Vigo Mortensen. Yeah, I guess it can't be the most prevalent instance of male nudity since it is in soft focus. But we can return to Jack. I mean, uh, Jack has a wife, or he's going to have a Uh wife. So that makes him shitty. And he's abandoning his friend all the time. He's constantly leaving his friend. That's shitty. And I don't know if you could... I mean, this, this gets into a weird ethical line that, you know, who am I to fucking say anyways? But I don't know if you can fault him for telling this woman that he loves her... And not relating, because as uh, Miles points out, he probably means all yeah, of these things. Yeah, that's true. I suppose if you're getting married the next day, you, yeah, there's the line, right? Yeah. Once again, we found the line on Double Feature. The line is, if you're getting married the next day, don't say, hey, I'm going to move up here and take care of your sure. kid. That right. would be bad. That would if be a lie. If there's any possibility, I mean, there, at that point, there is no possibility that you are not lying. Yeah. You are absolutely lying 100%. You're lying to somebody, or more likely to everybody. Seeing Including the way, yourself. Seeing the way he uh, he takes his, you know, fiance's phone calls or, oh, I lucked out. She's not home or whatever. He's mm-hmm. obviously trying to get away from that. He deserves every bit of that brutal motorcycle helmet beatdown. As a pacifist, I'm going to force myself not to agree with you. I'm going to go the dude route on this. Yeah, I mean, if you're in that situation and you're about to get married and then you're trying to have a little bit of a fling before you do. Assuming we take out the component where that's betrayal to your soon-to-be wife, right? Uh, let's say she's okay with that or whatever, you at least restrain yourself from telling someone, I'm going to run away with you sure. until after you explain that you have a wife. Yeah. Those could maybe even be the same conversation. Yep. I'm going to have a wife. Uh, I, I plan to not do that and run away with you instead. Maybe that's when you know those things should right. be brought up. So there are these different layers then of how people interpret the film, yeah. of uh, whether or not the film is to be taken seriously. Or how seriously. It labels itself as both a drama and a comedy. Mm-hmm. So certainly there are things in it that are meant to be funny, but there are also things that are fucking hilarious. Right. And we can't quite figure out yeah. if they're supposed to be hilarious. Right. right? This is uh, one of those movies that, I mean, after people saw this, their reaction to it was I mean, it was kind of the same as, uh, you know, the bucket list or right. the sex in the city sure. stuff. These things where you see it and you go, well, that's what I'm going to do with my life. Hey, I right. should really go on a, a wine vacation and sniff wine with my buddy in soft focus. Yeah. Or, you know, I'm going to create a list of things I do before I die or I'm going to have 
sex in the I don't actually know what happens in Sex in the City. They sex shop a lot. City. There's a lot of shopping. Shopping, Sex City. But you want to talk about cliches. I mean, you hear that joke all the time, like, which Sex in the City character are you? Uh-huh. That's uh, people placing themselves inside a a fun but human enough adventure they could actually have. Right. Tasting wine with your buddy is not so much of an adventure it's impossible for people right. to do. It kind sure. of just seems like a little bit of a getaway. You gas money. Yeah, Right. Gas money and wine money, maybe. Although if you find these taste things, as long as you don't demand a bottle and then pour people's spit all over yourself. So that's where I wonder where the interpretation comes in. Because if people can take this on enough of a surface that it's just uh, a movie about people hanging out and enjoying wine and whatever, maybe that isn't as funny to them as it is to us. Right. Well, there's this vibe that I get from it that the entire film is a farce of the pretentious people who go to wine country for wine tastings and sit there and sip wine and explain to people why their hard work wasn't good enough this year and put all their lives in terms of the wine they have. And the the one scene that I remember watching through this time that made me shout at Miles was when they had the wine at Stephanie's house. Right. And he says... Oh yeah, this this is good. What do you think? And she says, "Oh, I don't know. I I feel like they tried a little too hard, and right. maybe there's a little bit too al- right. too much alcohol, and it's covering the fruit." And he sips it again, and then looks at her as if completely shocked and surprised, and he says, "You know what? You're right. Yeah, good job." Well, so here's the thing: is most of the metaphors in the film are pretty apparent. Sure. Uh, But sometimes something like that shows up and it sucks that the metaphor is more veiled. And also the question it would be answering is, are there metaphors that are more of it? You know what I mean? Sure. Uh, We're wondering if there's an even deeper layer to this film where maybe it's kind of poking fun at itself or Uh how there's a bunch of wine metaphors on the surface. Right. But we don't know if it has. Yeah, because it also seems to be poking fun of him as a writer, but also taking seriously the art of being a writer because right. they keep making jokes about how his book is so fucking long. Yeah. Right. But then right. at the same time, everybody who talks about the book completely seriously goes, it's just one of those instances where the art doesn't surpass the market. Yeah. So you never know if the movie's poking right. fun at itself because the things it uses to tell you that are the very things you're wondering if it understands it's doing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's that constant interpretation question about. Uh, what's actually there versus what are you bringing in? You know, the the scenes where Miles, I mean, his opinion of the wine seems completely dependent on his mood at the time. Right. When he's in a bad mood, the wine is shit. When he's off having exciting wine adventures or more importantly, trying to impress someone with his wine knowledge, the wine suddenly has six or seven different, you know, ingredients in it. But I guess that's true too of the way he tears the wines down. Right. The way it's just a bunch of scraps of garbage mixed together Uh random leaves and shit you find on the ground but where a lot of people might look at this and say wine metaphors too obvious i think there's something kind of commendable about that Uh we talked about that a little bit when we talked about the stephen king show we talked misery and christine right and uh and one of the things one of the many things we unfairly flung at stephen king was hey your metaphor is really fucking obvious, and then uh-huh. you explain them, and then you have a character talk about hey remember when we explained the metaphor? Just really driving a lot of that home where maybe it didn't need to be. But uh, one of the things I remember saying on that show was, "Bravo Stephen King, somebody needs to do that so someone gets it for the first time. Mm-hmm. Someone needs to uh, make these things more obvious to enlighten people on metaphors." Right. Well, I believe you when we were talking about it, you said. Some films need to have metaphors like this for the people who see four films a year. Yeah, well, that's definitely true. If you're not aware that there are things buried within films, you're probably not uh, enjoying them or or getting the rewatchability that you could be. Mm -hmm. And so Sideways does people a a great service in kind of talking about uh, the metaphor as a mechanism. Right. If you're well-versed in metaphor and you understand looking at a situation as a representation of another situation, mm-hmm. obvious metaphor stuff isn't completely lost on you. You can still evaluate how, uh, how straightforward that might be. Mm-hmm. And it also calls attention to why these characters might need fucking metaphors. Yeah. I mean, look at their lives. Well, yeah. I mean, especially with characters like Miles 
and Jack where they're not in touch with themselves to the point that they need to be. Sure. Where Miles is describing the Pinot grape Mm -hmm. and he's actually describing himself. Eventually he realizes it and becomes uncomfortable. Sure. But also Jack doesn't have any self-realization. He's out fucking Stephanie, out fucking Cammy, and then eventually breaks down sobbing because he can't lose Christine. And that's the point of realization where you realize that he's not aware of his own self Mm -hmm. until he's become, you know, too far removed from it. Yeah, so you could find these uh, simple metaphors to be a way that the characters accidentally learn about themselves. Right, exactly. If they the stumble upon this. If the character is as uncomfortable with themselves as, as say, you or me or Podmanity is with obvious metaphors, then the metaphors become necessary and yeah. the rest of us have to swallow that. Yeah, it's that very uh, ability of the mechanism itself in, in writing to explain something in a different context that's to be appreciated here by the characters. Sure. By Miles, who doesn't want to reflect on his situation at all, but can use this vast knowledge he has of wines to suddenly, it makes the light bulb turn on for him. But it's a little blurry. It turns on that blurry light bulb uh-huh. in addition to making things uh, easier for him to talk about. He has this kind of wow moment, this aha moment. But the other thing metaphors will allow you to do is take a different look at something, kind of strip away... Uh, other things that might be baggage, clouding your judgment or getting you involved directly, your frame. rubbing Vaseline on your lens, you know, things that could obscure your, your vision. But you understand what I'm saying, right? You have a situation that you can't look at objectively. Right. And so you use a metaphor for things you are completely impartial to. You understand this metaphor. He understands wine better than himself. You take that, uh, that application of knowledge and suddenly he's learned something about himself. Right. Thusly, the great mechanism of the metaphor. Thanks, metaphors. We have two movies on the show next time. You can find those movies in the upper right-hand corner of DoubleFeatureShow.com. Didn't think I was going to sneak that back in there, did you? Oh, I didn't, but now I do. If you're looking to send some feedback, check back in, answer some questions, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. You can also review us on iTunes. You can definitely go right on iTunes and you can leave a, a little review thing. So we have two movies on the show next time. What uh, what else are we doing? Uh, next time we're going to do something completely obvious that needs no explaining. We're going to do 12 Angry Men, the classic. It's one of the you know best 12 films Angry of all Men. time. Yeah, everybody knows 12 uh, Angry Men. We're going to pair that up with Predators. Oh, yeah, right. The the recent one. Yeah, yeah. everybody knows Predators. That's sure. a... Wow. Do you do you want to even take a... No, I don't. Watch more fucking film. God damn it.